for a very generous introduction. Uh, I hope I'm audible to the uh, people who have uh, taken trouble to hook on to Zoom for this talk. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to Professor Karuna Karan, the president and the brain behind this whole event, mm -hmm. and several others who have taken trouble to organize this. My uh, talk today is about the linguistic landscape of India. How exactly can we learn the lesson? Uh, I'm sure we have all noticed that uh, after World War II, there have been many, many new nations, many nation states. And as they were trying to build their countries, they understood that they need to address the issue of languages and culture. We had a constitutional decisions to make about our languages, how do we protect and promote our uh, multilingualism. So freshly out of the conflict situation, we were all looking for ways to establish peace and tranquility and equity. But as we all know, uh, it's not just a question of India. It's India, Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, everywhere. The whole linguistic terrain is very uneven. So it was the great responsibility of the initial political leaders immediately after World War II to decide what should their linguistic landscape look like. So that's the question with which they began. Now, in most cases, the decisions were made from top. The decisions were made from central government until a time came when there was resentment from bottom. Now, I'm particularly referring to the, to the agitation for uh, recognition of uh, you know, separate statehood. For and, and we all know that the, uh, we had to lose very important people like Pokhtishri Ramulu uh, for that. Uh, there was also agitation to have a separate statehood for Maharashtra, a separate statehood for Karnataka. So there were ground level agitations. So a decision was taken quite often from the central government, from the top about languages. And quite often there are agitations from bottom. So there's a pressure from the top and the pressure from below. And the countries had remained engaged in resolving this conflict between the top and the bottom. Now, what were the options before us? One option before us was to decide that the society is left as a stage for competition. Whoever will fight, whoever will succeed, whoever will win, it is their problem. This is one option. The other viewpoint is that we look at the whole thing as a system in terms of systematic unity so that people from diverse cultural background, diverse linguistic background can all be together. Now, we begin with some premises. As you all know, India writes in so many languages and speaks uh, in so many voices. We are all aware of that. Uh, India, which is also called sometimes Bharat, in the Indian name, we have always absorbed numerous thoughts, practices, and speech. This is something which the world leaders, anybody who knows India or South Asia in general, they're appreciative about that here it has given birth to so many religions, so many philosophies, so many ideas. Since independence, as we all know, through the census mechanism, as well as through other mechanisms, through constitutional provisions, multilingualism has been promoted. Multilingualism has been protected. Nobody said that in India, there should be only one flag, one party, one language, one culture, one dress, one food habits, nothing of that sort. Everybody has right to, to 
to practice their own languages, their own culture, their own societies, social habits, etc. Et However, the fact remains that uh, we have a lot more to do. We have to promote our intercultural dialogue. And particularly, we have to take care of the smaller languages of India. Now, I would request you to look at this interesting statement made by the former national professor, Sumiti Kumar Chatterjee. As you know, Chatterjee was highly respected both in North India as well as in South India, East India as well as West India. He was a true representative of the Indian languages and somebody who could speak in 35 languages. And I've been privy to some of his talks in many, many other languages. I ran from here to there with my father quite often to listen to Chatterjee. And he had made a very interesting comment about India in this context. He said that in India, after an initial period of hostile contact, finally, all the communities settle down for a peaceful commingling, cultural, cultural fusion as well as racial fusion. And that is something which is very strange about India. Therefore, he called it a land which has a harmony, which shows a harmony of contrasts. Now, this is very interesting. Whereas the Nehruvian policy was talking about unity and diversity, Chatterjee talked about harmony of contrasts. What a beautiful way of putting it together. Now, what did India do? India went for the second option, that is tolerance, the option of tolerance, option of promoting, protecting, pluriculturalism and multilingualism. So I would say, and I would agree with uh, Lachman Khupchandani in this context, that India has been standing on a plurality square, on the crossroad of language, literature, culture, and social practice for several millennia. But throughout this history, we have been negotiating among ourselves, blending various, sometimes opposite viewpoints, experimenting in many ways in speaking, celebrating, singing, dancing, living, and performing in all aspects of life. I'll give you one example, because the India was not really the kind of India which is today. In ancient times, India comprised also the areas in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Nepal. It's a large country up to spending, I mean, going way up to Burma and down south, even towards Sri Lanka. So, in this kind of scenario, look at this situation where the Malla kings of Nepal used to organize theaters, performances. And in these performances, the plays were uh, written by the people from Mithila, my own language, native language, Maithili. These plays were in Maithili. The songs were invariably from uh, Karnataka. So there were Kannada songs and the performers, the dancers always came from Telangu Desha, Telugu speakers, dancers. So here is a situation where a king is from Malla dynasty in Nepal. The language of performance is Maithili. The songs are being sung in Kannada and the dancers are from Telangu Desha, Telugu. What a beautiful scenario. This is something which is not decided by language planners. This is something which is decided from the bottom, from the people down. Now, when we talk about landscaping or linguistic landscaping, how does it work? Let me explain that. I'm sure there are some people among us who are, uh, who are very good in architectural designs. And they would remember that there are seven principles in our Seven principles They say when you want to actually decide on landscaping, you have to make it simple. There should be a variety, there should be a balance, there should be a proper emphasis, there should be a good sequencing, then scale or proportion, and finally there should be a complete unity of design. 
Now, I've given some comments on the screen here for those who want to go into detail at a later point of time. But the basic idea is that don't really, when you want to plan for a building, for a space, don't make it very complicated. Make it simple. The idea should be simple. And at the same time, there should be various things. When you are actually drawing up some design, when you are actually doing a painting, when you're doing a landscaping, there should be different things of different shapes, sizes, and forms. But among them, there should be a good balance. And then you decide which one you want to accentuate, where you want to put your emphasis. Now, we all traditionally know that a great language like Tamil has been doing human service to the entire world by producing fantastic philosophical texts, religious texts, literary texts, music, etc., etc., for so many thousand years. Now, if I'm planning for entire India, when I'm deciding where are my accents going to be, obviously one of the important accents is going to be in Tamil. Similarly, an accent is going to be on Hindi, which is understood by a large number of people. So there are languages which automatically become candidates for attracting this emphasis. Then when you are actually arranging something, there has to be something in sequence and scale or proportion. And finally, the entire language driven country should look like a unified whole. I think this is very crucial. Now, I would say that this entire country, India, has been going through three different stages and three different uh, tendencies it is showing. It is showing a tendency of assimilation, tendency of merger, and tendency of split. This is very interesting that we have lots of ups and downs throughout our political history, cultural history. We have also seen one of the theories is that there were the country was whole space was inhabited by the negrotoids who eventually vanished, leaving only traces. And by the time the Indo-Europeans came from outside, who were themselves in a way within court barbarians, they were themselves nomads. We already had in India the other communities, the Dravidas, the Nishadas, and the Kirantas. So these newcomers naturally went into clash with these people, trying to conquer and win over them. So Chatterjee has a very interesting description to make. And he says that initially, these Indo-Europeans basically were very weak in number. Not that they were numerous, uh, but they had the inner vitality. They had superior, uh, you know, strong organization, strong discipline, perhaps better war, better instruments, that is, you know, better fighters, and, uh, you know, ability to withstand trouble, go on. Whereas people already, those in, who in, inhabited India, where people who were peaceful, who were culturally very really significant, who were engaged in literary activity, drawing, designing, music, and all those things. So there was an attempt from the Indo-Europeans to not only come and win over, but also to impose their languages in the entire space. So we had languages like Sanskrit uh, coming in. Eventually, what has happened was that we all know in linguistics, nothing stays permanently stable. A language keeps on changing from time to time, from place to place, from generation to generation. As a result, the Indo-Aryan itself or Indo-Iranian itself got split into so many different families and so many different languages. So the eventual result today is that we have so many Indo-Aryan languages. And then there are, of course, the earlier ones 
so many Dravidian languages and Austric languages and the Kiranta languages. Now we are all aware of the range of multilingualism in India. 1576 rationalized mother tongues, 1796 other mother tongues, 122 languages, 22 in the constitutions, which, are, which cover roughly 96% of our space. So they cover a lot of space. Another 20 uh, Austric and 98 sino tibetan languages make up 2%. We know that we have Sahit Academy, which, awards, which gives away awards in 24 languages. Those 22 in the constitution, plus English and plus Rajasthani. We have magazines and newspapers published every day, every week in 101 languages. Radio programs were used to be in 146. In the recent uh, interaction that I had with All India Radio, they said that we, so now we beam in 176 languages. And there was already a survey which was conducted by Padmanavan and McConnell and Mahapatra which said that 50 languages are there, which have a lot of literary vitality. Now you know where to put the accent. These are the 50 languages where the accent will be put. In the schools, NCRT reports tell us that there were 69 languages, now 33. And we know that roughly 69 to 71 languages are facing the threat of extinction and development. Now we have 14 writing systems, but then in total writing systems will be 66. If you look at the 19, oh, 1901 census, 1951 census, 1961 census, which were not all comparable, truly speaking, the, these figures kept on changing. Now, where should we, where should we put our you know, attention to? One of the important tasks ahead is that there are a large number of speakers of Indian languages who seem to be like this bird in the cage longing for freedom. This freedom, unfortunately, is available only to a few fortunate fellow Indian languages, fellow Indian speakers of languages who are represented in the Indian constitution. Now, those of you who are uh, looking at the market, the market situation, we see that in the market, there are first layer, there is eight languages. These eight languages have a lot of publicity, sales, a lot of visual, visual impact in the cities, the way the signboards are written, Telugu, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, Bangla, Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati. If you look at these, these are in the first top layer of languages. Where the, where the languages, the films are made, where the, these languages are doing very well. But then there are other languages which are not far behind. I mean, Odia is not far behind. There are other languages which are catching up very well. Punjabi is doing very well. So there are second layer of eight languages. And then there are last layer of eight languages, the late comers. Those languages which were recognized by the constitution much later. Languages like Santali, like Bodo, uh, and other languages. Now, as stakeholders of education, what can we do? I think what we can do is that we, can, we should bring in some changes in our entire language landscape so that these languages which are less practiced, smaller in size, do not disappear from the entire scene. They should also be available in our schools, in our various avenues. So cultural context and creative writing, all these are very important. Now I talked about Khup Chandani's plurality square. Uh, I'm sure you can, you remember, some of you who listened to me earlier will remember the design of Khup Chandani in his book, uh, which we published under the sage. And this book is called Revisualizing Boundaries. And in that boundary in the book, you look at the four squares, language, culture, society, and literature. As a language planner, as somebody who's interested in linguistic landscaping, you bring in any change in any one of these, there'll be repercussion elsewhere. 
and this is very interesting that indian entire space is linked up like this and we know that our texts have been traveling uh we have mahabharata available in so many languages in india we have ramayana available in so many languages in india uh i have seen people working in bihar on the story of the dalits who work on lorik lorikayan and suddenly you go to rajasthan you find there is another story called pandayan which sound very similar the song are sounding very similar so our texts have somehow been traveling we don't know how they are doing it but they are traveling across time and across space and this is something which is already available in the rigveda in the rigveda there is a question which is addressed by the uh, authors of rigveda i don't know i did not want to claim who who created who constructed this text but there is a question who created language and the answer that is given in sanskrit is yatra dhira manasa vacha makrita it is the wise who in their wisdom have created language now what do you do with this language this is also another question which was asked and the answer that is given is that it is through speech that friends see and recognize each other and mark their friendship now this is something which sounds like the symbol that you are using here for your organization which says that protect the language and develop the language because it is the language through which you can protect and promote your friends now best example of this is coming from mahabharata we all know mahabharata was authored by krishna dwaipaya and vyasa and if you ask me frankly i would say that he was perhaps the most important and ancient folklorist because he'll put us to shame because he has woven stories which he gathered from so many places from manipura to kandahara you know gandhari came from uh, kandahara which is now in afghanistan as you can see it's a mega text mahabharata has so many multiple nestings and what did chatterjee say about mahabharata he said so with, if you do not mind the color prejudice he said that he is somebody who is from the dark race had a brahmin father but a dasa mother satyavati was the mother and probably satyavati was born partly aryan partly austric family and there is a provision there is a possibility that the grandmother was a chandala woman now look at this situation you are breaking down all the caste barriers your oldest most sacred which today many people will try to claim brahmanical text it's not brahmanical it's a text where the stories are stories about people from all walks of life different castes communities different areas regions this is a great example of convergence i'm sure in the during the sangam time in classical tamil or during writing of the vachana text in medieval kannada similar things happened that people came from different castes and communities and they all contributed their might to create beautiful texts so language and literature in india literary texts in india have always been building bridges they have never stood as barriers they have acted in india as means to access the other cultures the those of you who remember shishir kumar das's two volumes of modern literature published by sahitya academy where 22 of us were editors of the volume just see that the first novel comes up in bengali in 1801 raja pratapadit te chorit within a year 
it's available in marathi translation now you were ask you can ask me you said how did how did it happen how how is it that somebody came to know in remote maharashtra that somebody in bengal published a new genre a new kind of text a new kind of writing called a novel upanya and then finding it very new they rendered it into marathi now this is something which has been happening in india a lot uh, i remember my friend ayappa panikkar uh, took me aside when i went to read poetry in uh, trichur and he said that can you tell me how many books of bengali do we have in malayalam i said i don't know i have no idea then he took me to the book exhibition and showed me a large number of books all translated from so many very able translators like nilima ibrahim from bengali into malayalam now this is something which is peculiar of india the challenge of homogenization that we face today sometimes it's very dangerous because it comes with a package deal the package deal is you have to carry with it the globalization so they are trying to destroy our landscape linguistic landscape our intercultural heritage so i would say the task of responsible yes, social justice would be to work on this large reservoir of language in india the paradigm of translatability therefore is very important i would therefore when i was creating this cares at the bottom my reason for putting an equal emphasis on linguistic and translation was that these are the two methods these are the two tools for all of us to create our linguistic landscape and that can happen only through integration now a lot of people tell me sir why there should be conflict why should a language fight with another language why should there be fight between the states and the center sometimes between one state and another state on language issue i would say that we'll look in a in a in a large space like india which is almost like a continent when a social system is evolving the institutional links have to develop and stabilize bringing in a web of interdependence we cannot do without each other today if somebody is looking for an option in food then today we have to decide are we going to go for a bengali cuisine today are we going to go for a cuisine which is in north india or are we going to have a, a, a food which is typical dravidian food because you know we have so many options in india anyone who tries to look for writing and models and methods um, you know some model writers who are our ideal uh, you know creative people we always look for somebody else so therefore we know we we are we are used to that way and we do not mind if a, if there is a story which is coming in as a film initially in tamil then it gets into kannada then it comes to marathi then it becomes a hindi film and becomes a big hit this is a typical thing this is a typical india which is not to be surprised about and people from outside are very surprised how is it that you know we are surviving with so many different cultures and communities and languages so there is a dialectical linkage between this integration and conflict sometimes integration can occur only when there is a conflict situation conversely there are other times where conflict becomes necessary to reach an integration so it's natural that this large country would go through these cycles over different period of time to draw up its linguistic landscape in any civil society paradigm the role of state will be to bring in a kind of balance not disrupt balance and that is the lesson for many new and emerging nation states thank you very much for being very patient about my talk i did not want to take up too much of space and too much of time i thought that the most important thing is to talk about how exactly 
we are managing ourselves how is it that we should be managing ourselves and how do we design our language landscape in a complicated plural scenario we do not need to go for monolingualism monoculturalism we are good as we are and will be always better because there was a time in 1970s when there were some social linguists who said that your country is going to be economically backward because you speak so many languages because you have so many cultures you can't manage yourself today if you look at the indian economy uh, of course covid situation has created problems for everybody not for us alone also for the us economy also for chinese economy but indian economy before that had been doing reasonably well going from strength to strength and in spite of the fact that we speak so many languages we write in so many languages we make so many different kind of films etc etc and this is common thing we have a lot of very good bengali singers from originally from kolkata who are very popular as the tamil singers in the films i listed as malayalam singers in the films we have people like lata mangeshkar singing bengali songs singing languages in languages which are spoken in different parts of the country this is common thing this is nothing which is uncommon therefore our language landscape has to be plural thank you very much ah are enagadevi madam you can proceed if there are questions or comments i'll be happy to answer please renagadevi madam you can unmute okay you can proceed the program thank you professor hi everybody Start promoting lecture. Now, some questions from the audience. One by one. Yeah. Anybody? Yes, please. Questions? Are any clarification? Any participants? Do you have any questions? To come to the panel. Hello. 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 Ah, uh, please. Any question? Ah, uh, please, KK sir, Professor Kanagaran sir. Okay. Ah, uh, ah, uh, please. Please. Hello. Yes, Professor Kanagaran. Yeah. Thank you for presenting our invitation and uh, request. We uh, are a an address or a teacher, and I am happy that you have chosen an interesting topic uh, for a linguistic landscape. I think, and you are the first uh, uh, scholar to. Um, explain your uh, uh, language planning process uh, in a wider way covering i think historical social linguistic literary uh, content uh, uh, from various languages uh, of india especially aryan and dravidian and other languages It is. It was quite interesting that uh, you have uh, uh, given us uh, um, avenues and uh, um, areas uh, um, uh, so that our researcher can select a couple of them quite easily, and also they can work on some of the issues, some of the problems uh, 
it's not that easy to uh, do research uh, covering multilingual uh, uh, setup in multilingual context. Uh, so they have to choose uh, an area that is more important from the point of view of communication and also from the point of view of language uh, uh, planning. Uh, multilingualism is very complex these days. Uh, um, it, it approaches uh, the issues uh, through different uh, policies of the uh, government uh, um, and also the state governments and their own proposals. So without uh, consulting uh, the people or those who are in the different areas of education or uh, media or other types of language use. So it becomes, uh, it has become very complex these days to plan um, the use of language in a particular state with particular reference to um, uh, the multiple multilingual context. So my uh, request to young researchers, they should take up research involving the current problems. You see, uh, the policy makers, they have their own uh, views, but at the same time, uh, they don't uh, want to take our uh, instructions, our advice, uh, or our suggestions uh, in planning for uh, better use, uh, uh, better language use, uh, mainly for the uh, students, researchers, public people, media, and so on. So my request uh, is uh, uh, that they should uh, come forward uh, to suggest uh, areas, uh, some areas, uh, whatever uh, um, you call it. So, and the initiate uh, good research uh, with particular reference to the use of uh, languages, Indian languages, at least uh, the Indian languages, uh, and also uh, the language, the languages as medium of uh, uh, instruction in our higher education. Higher education is suffering a lot these days. Uh, one to one language, one in the all one. But I don't know how to plan all these things. It's not that easy uh, to plan the language in a multilingual context. There are number of problems, complex problems. So we, uh, I think you have your lecture has different areas that uh, in the yeah. Hello. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah, I think the uh, the comment was very valuable. There were two questions that I see on the board, on the chat board. One is, how do we uh, see multilingual education? Do I support multilingual education? Another question is, what can we do for the minority languages? Uh, education. Well, both are interesting questions. Uh, I would say that already multilingualism is built into our education system. If you look at our languages, look at our schools, uh, they already teach uh, the international language, uh, the language uh, which is state official language, and the language is widely understood or officially used by the government of India. So that is already done. As far as the minority languages are concerned, that's an area of concern, that nothing much is being done, although there is constitutional provision, there's already a commissioner for linguistic minorities, there are complaints going, but nothing much is happening there. I can talk about this in some other day, on some other day, in some other session, but that is something very important. Thank you, Professor. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, can I can I say something? I am Professor Rajarama from University of Hyderabad. Uh, proceed, proceed, Madam. 
Uh, sir, nice to hear you after a very long time, sir. This is Rajarama. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering uh, because, uh, uh, of course, I came for the lecture late and I missed uh, quite some uh, part of your talk. I was just wondering uh, about uh, don't you think that there is, when you said that two languages compete with each other, I think that's the one of the, these things. There is an inherent hierarchy that the society has uh, uh, towards the languages in a multilingual society it is one language that we use more uh, you know much more than other languages because when you look for when you think of the official communication it is always in either in english or hindi as against the local languages and then local languages for other functions of use that is one thing and uh, what role i mean in education planning not only the minority languages today i find that even a major language like uh, like telugu is at risk because it's being you know taken away as medium of instruction and uh, the education policies the three language formula and all these are ideally there but then like uh, the mother tongue medium of instruction uh, and the local language and the languages like a major language like uh, Telugu is also uh, threatened, you know, like because of the state policies to replace it with English. So under these conditions, as a linguist, I feel that, uh, you know, what is the role of a linguist? Are we consulted at all when language planning happens or how does language planning take place? And do we have something like a language planning in India at all? This is my well, I would, uh, Rajarama, I understood, let me answer very briefly because the time must be running out. Yes. Uh, the point is that there should be also language movement along with language plan. I said that from top to bottom you plan and from bottom to top also you resent and you plan. So, a lot of planning is to be done by the parents. A lot of planning, because if there are very large number of Telugu parents who are very, very, uh, you know, protestive about the kind of uh, wrong decision within both wrong decisions taken by the state government and I'm sure they will, they will come out on the street and make the protests uh, possible and if this happens there will be change if you all if all of us accept whatever is imposed upon us by people who do not understand value is a problem. You should not accept everything uncritical. That is the problem. So, language planning is not just something which has to be done by people from top. Language planning also needs to be taken up by the parents from the bottom. Okay, sir. Sir, thank you. Uh, can I thank you, sir. Can I have your one question? Okay. Sir, this is Bala Subramanian, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much for an excellent speech. Sir, you, you were uh, referring to Professor Kupchandani's model. And uh, you also mentioned about uh, emphasis on different languages. On, uh, for example, some uh, Sakitya Academy or uh, radio or some such a way. And uh, at, at the same time, different languages for different roles, they are uh, competing for recognition. How are we going to address this issue? Because at different levels, they are competing for different recognition. How are we going to address it? Well, uh, this is a very complicated uh, question and it doesn't have a very simple answer because uh, it so happens that right from uh, classical languages recognition to other kinds of recognition, I've been part of the government committees and I know how things work, but uh, the issue is a lot of this recognition would come uh, if there is a lot of merit in the proposal. Uh, if there is a lot of struggle that is exhibited very clearly from the speech community, from the literary community, then naturally there will be uh, you know, some effort for people to recognize it. So, important thing is to not to really be complacent about it, but to make the demand. See, it's possible in a democracy, nothing comes uh, only through court, only through the government. 
a lot of things happen also because of the demands of the people so if you did not demand certain things and you will not never get it because there was a demand for konkani because there was a demand for uh, various other languages like santali or bodo the demands were met with it is very important therefore is movements for languages will have to be think in a positive manner thank you sir thank you thank you sir there are uh, a few questions in the chat box do you like to answer them uh, which are the other questions uh, one is from and the chat board there are two questions okay yes um uh, are you able, uh, able to see that i can one see one, there is one question which is asked by lakshmi priya yeah is, is talking about language conflicts and what about the migrant minority languages yeah yeah this is very crucial and as you yeah. know roughly 15 to 20% of indians are always on the move if you look at look at entire india you will find that very large number of migrant speakers speech community people because of the livelihood because to get better life etc they shift and migrate to other places now what happens is there is peer pressure your children you are a tamilian settled in kolkata your children can choose you can choose your children send your children to tamil medium school you may have some very rarely one or two such schools in kolkata or you may decide to send them to other schools the moment you send them to the other schools there is this peer pressure pressure from the other school children classmates etc and there they make those compromises uh, they may come back home and speak to you in your own language but they would be more comfortable speaking in the language of the friends language is used in the school etc etc so they become naturally bilingual and this is a typical situation that happens with the migrant minority speech communities wherever the major language groups have gone there is always an attempt that if there is no uh, school which is teaching through their own mother tongue then at least there should be a community school saturday school some uh, community or society driven attempts to teach them uh, in their own heritage language and i think that should also be encouraged a uh, lot of misconceptions are there that if you put a child or expose a child to four languages the child will collapse nothing happens a child is able to speak so many languages very naturally only thing is that the child should be exposed thank you sir sir i ask a question is there anybody Sir, I ask one question. Any questions? Any more questions? Yes. Sir, I ask one question. I pass it on. Please. Uh, Please. Uh, Proceed. Uh, work, uh, do, sir, do, good evening, do, sir. Do. Uh, good evening, sir. I am Dr. Prasunban from CAL, sir. Uh, regarding language learning, is it audible, sir? Yes, it's audible. Okay. Yes, audible. Regarding language planning, uh, the official language status for the uh, uh, constitutionally recognized language. What is the problem to recognize these twenty-two languages for official official language? Because in some classical and at least some classical language may be recognized uh, for the official status in India. So some, if you take the case of Singapore, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka, the classical language is recognized there as an official language. Why government of India to take at least this twenty-two languages in the constitutional recognized languages or classical languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, etc. Why? The, what is the problem in recognizing uh, the? Uh, Languages, these languages for for a few questions. Be brief. Next question. We are running out of time. Be brief. One question. Okay, over, over. Uh, uh, professor, uh, you can uh, answer first. 
Well, I, I, I think uh, the answer to that is very difficult to give in <laughs> one minute. I would uh, ask you to urge you to write to me an email so that I can discuss it uh, over email. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, Thank you, Professor. Uh, Rena, uh, Ramamurthy uh, wants yeah. to speak. Uh, yeah. Uh, Madam, please. Uh, yeah, Professor Udayana Singh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for accept, accepting our invitation. Uh, and as you said, you are the only linguist who can integrate the literature with the language planning, starting from Rig Veda and uh, uh, Mahabharata, how, you know, uh, the uh, points, you take points from that and uh, explain the multilingualism and language planning. My question is, it's not question, uh, there is always a conflict between uh, the top, uh, top-down approach and also bottom-up approach in planning. Even though in the recent uh, uh, language planning, you know, uh, the educational policy of the uh, government, there are lots of scope for uh, introducing mother tongue and also integrating lots of languages or encouraging multilingualism. But when you take care of the uh, aspiration of the people, it is always in opposition to that. You know, they, they wanted to educate their children to do through the language which gives them <laughs> economic benefit. And how do you, you know, how can we uh, bridge this kind of, you know, conflicts? So I know that Dr. Ramuthi, the main issue, is, main issue is that economics uh, of the society uh, will definitely be a problem which parents will have to deal with. And there are many, many models available uh, people like me, who studied only through Bangla medium schools, who were not able to speak in English, even as we entered colleges, I don't think you are doing so badly compared to those who went to the purely English medium schools. Uh, it, it's all a question of attitude. And the parents will have to be encouraged to look at the model that there are a very large number of people who are not necessarily exposed as a child to A for apple and B for ball, and yet they do well in, in so many languages. So, it's only lack of confidence in our system, in our language, that is responsible for this. There are many other questions on the chat board, but I can't read all of them. I hope to be able to answer them separately at some other point of time. Madam, uh, thank you, sir. Prem is, thank you, sir. Madam, Madam, uh, uh, Prem, is, Prem wants huh? to speak, Madam. Okay. Prem, uh, Prem, sir, Prem, Kumar, Prem Kumar. Sir, already, Prem. already uh, I have asked a question and uh, he has replied for okay. that also. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If, if there, is, there are no other questions, the file, final one from me. Nowadays, we are able to hear the One India slogan. Is it possible in this multicultural, multilingual nation? Well, I would say that we don't talk about many Indias. Yeah. We always talk about, in terms of politics, in terms of the international politics, we talk about one India. But when it comes to culture, then there are many Indias anyway, whether you like it or not. We have many Indian foods, many Indian dresses, many Indian music, many Indian cinema. In literature, who denies that? Nobody can deny that. So that's the difference between, uh, you know, the concept of one India and many India. I think we are going to live with this conflict uh, for a long time. Madam, sorry for the disturbance. Before what up? Thanks, Professor Karnagaran wants to speak some things. Professor Karnagaran, sir. Yeah. No, just I wanted to do uh, one or two points uh, uh, for the consideration of uh, research and planning uh, planners uh, at the uh, level and also uh, in different domains. Uh, um, I think that Rodai has uh, given a very wider uh, no map um, to choose uh, some of the areas, uh, minority languages, uh, official languages, and so on. 
So we have to work on independent projects, especially uh, the linguistic departments or language departments in association with the different uh, social sciences uh, and see that uh, we come with some proposals, you know, uh, so that uh, there is a meeting with the government of India, government of Tamil Nadu, or government of uh, West Bengal, and so on, so that, you know, they can understand the problems uh, and do something for the uh, upliftment of language use in the respective states uh, and also cooperate with each other uh, in the sense that uh, the language policies which we enact uh, to be useful for the uh, society throughout India because uh, in order to solve some of the multilingual problems, it becomes necessary, essential, this moment of time. You see that we undertake uh, serious research so that we can suggest it to the government to improve the status planning because without the government, uh, I don't think we can easily solve the language uh, policies, uh, problems with because of language policies. However, we have to do uh, work with the partners that not uh, a large number of uh, areas that work and collect materials and see that uh, languages can be better utilized and used in the coming years for the betterment of the society So are you going to answer? No, no, no. Let's go. No, there is no answer. It's only comment. <laughs> okay. What are they? Okay, doing? okay, sir. Uh, if there are no other questions, I will call Dr. Selva Kumar to express a formal vote of thanks. Dr. Selva Kumar, are you able to clear me? Kamar, uh, yes, yes, madam. Dr. Selva Kumar. Dr. Selva Kumar. Dr. Selva Kumar. Dr. Selva Kumar. You can propose vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, my Professor Uday Narayan Singh, uh, I am very thankful to you on behalf of Tamil Muriel Changam and other organizers of Tamil Mulia Sangam and this uh, series of lectures. I would like to thank you and wholeheartedly. Uh, it is a very inspiring lecture. Uh, uh, even though we are, uh, our country is a multilingual, multicultural country, mm -hmm. the language planning is a very mm -hmm. difficult one for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so even then we are uh, talking about my language Planning and other things. Uh, thank you, sir. 
Good evening, everyone of you, to take part in this uh, weekly e lecture series core. So, first of all, I should thank uh, to the uh, uh, president of uh, Tamil Linguistics Forum, Professor Karanagaran, uh, for his uh, very dynamic uh, and active participation in this. And uh, uh, I would thank the secretary, uh, Professor Balas Brahmaniam, by chance. Of Tamil University and the admin Dr. Kamachi for, for uh, creating such an opportunity to listen to uh, students like me, Dr. Armani and all here, yeah, to listen to such a very uh, professor, Vain RNC. And, uh, I must uh, record my sincere thanks to protect uh, this reply, uh, madam. And uh, really, uh, we enjoy. So after a long time, so you just made an opportunity for us to listen uh, Professor's speech. So I just remember when we were all in his class, 91, 92, the way which he handled the class and also the uh, language which he uses very easily communicative and uh, always his speech has dynamic connection with the concept. So now I feel and I realize, uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for having accepted uh, and uh, delivered a very wonderful uh, speech uh, in the weekly e lecture series. Thank you very much, sir. And um, I, I thank uh, uh, there were many questions uh, and uh, uh, sharing also their opinions. Uh, orderly Professor Karnagaran and uh, Rajir, Dr. Rajirama and uh, Professor Balasubramaniam and uh, Lakshmi Priya and Dr. Pasumbar and Dr. Ramamurthy uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Prem and Madam Renuga Devi for your uh, questions and uh, uh, sharing your opinion. And Dr. Angan and other professors uh, in India and also overseas. So thank every one of you uh, for taking part in this. And uh, I must, I should not forget to thank the participants, uh, the scholars, the budding linguists, budding scholars of uh, Tamil literature and linguistics. Uh, who have uh, uh, taken uh, part in this uh, webinar and uh, probably they would have understand, understood what uh, Professor Odin uh, Singh is uh, trying to uh, let us understand. I hope that uh, this would be a very uh, uh, thought provoking uh, to understand, to know, to get more knowledge about uh, the multilingualism and really it is a uh, first lessons in language planning. So we are very grateful to you, sir. And uh, uh, I thank every one of you uh, to take part in this webinar. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, one and all. Thank you very much for the opportunity to the, uh, 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 everyone. And uh, finally, I should, again and again, I just wanted to thank Professor Udhain Narayan Singh on behalf of the Tamil Linguistics Forum for having uh, accepted our invitation uh, at, at this point, you have a tight schedule. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to close that um, session, which is inspired, inspiring lecture to all. Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you. No, sir. Hello.